welcome to PIES. Before we begin with the presentation of our speaker today, may we request Vice President Marika Ballesteros for the opening remarks. You're about to sit down. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, uh, Vice President with IPA in promoting evidence-based research and this program is part of the activities of this partnership. So the topic on employment really is a major challenge for developing countries, especially in the case of the Philippines, where employment growth has remained sluggish uh, despite remarkable uh, GDP growth we experience grew by only, for a period of uh, five years, grew by an average of only 1%. And then unemployment and underemployment remained high at 6% and 19% respectively. So actually, there are, the government has been implementing um, policy interventions for, uh, to improve this uh, um, uh, employment growth. And uh, there are several uh, what we call active lab labor market that directly provide work and increase the employability of people with certain disadvantages in the labor market. And we have seen that uh, being implemented by different agencies in the Philippines. And of course, uh, the DOLE, which is the main agency handling for labor and, handling labor and employment, has the largest number of these uh, programs, specifically under employment facilitation so uh, for today's uh, today's uh, uh, evaluation, which is the special uh, program for employment of students, is actually a dollar program that has been uh, uh, created since 1992 under RA 7223. And I, I understand that since then there have been uh, pressures to reform the program, not only in terms of uh, the service delivery, but also um, in terms of expanding uh, the program. So I think uh, that's about uh, almost 25 years, so it's about time that we do a thorough assessment of the program. Um, I, I haven't seen or read any uh, 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 initial evaluation of the program yet, so probably this is the, the, the first uh, detailed or impact evaluation study that has been done for so um, uh, I think um, it would be uh, the, the objectives of the program are, are if we look at impact evaluation and the, the, um, uh, what, but the issues that come to our mind is whether the program is achieved, uh, it's uh, end of the program outcomes, and whether there's a basis for continuing or expanding the program, especially in the light Free tuition fee, there's a uh, tuition fee program. So this study will provide us the opportunity to know and understand the issues, challenges, and lessons that come with the implementation of uh, the program. We are indeed honored to have with us uh, Dr. Emily Dean, the project team lead, to present to us the findings of the study. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the time the presence of uh, DOLE, the Institute of uh, Labor and Studies, Bureau of Local um, Employment, GIE, uh, OSLI, uh, I, and IPA, of course, who provided uh, research guidance and support. So uh, thank you, and let us uh, look forward to a fruitful discussion. Research Fellow at the Institute of, for the Study of Labor, and her work has been published in the Journal of Development Economics and Economic Development and Cultural Change. Her research interests are in labor and development economics, with a particular focus on employment and education policy. 
migration, fertility, and marriage, and the role of incomplete information and behavioral biases and individual decision making. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Emily Dean. a 
large flagship program, but we don't know a lot about how it works and if it does work, why. So we set out in partnership with Dole to answer three research questions. The first one that we wanted to ask ourselves, we asked was, was what the impact is, okay, that's not me, um, is what the impact is of SPES on youth academic outcomes. So the theory here is that this additional cash is important to help students stay in school, to finish their education, to graduate, um, maybe to become more motivated and earn higher grades. The second question we asked was what the impact is on youth employability. Again, here we thought that youth were going to be working at jobs for about 20 to 52 days. This could be their first experience in the formal sector. They learn about the importance of punctuality, good attitudes. They build specific work skills, usually in an office setting, but they might you know, improve their use of Microsoft Office, their coding, other skills that might be useful, and that might help them down the road. And finally, our third question was, what is the impact of SPES on youth employment and on their job search behaviors? And from a long-term perspective, you know, the, the idea of SPES is that students will stay in school and then eventually, because they're more likely to graduate, because they have higher educational aspirations, they are more attracted to employers. Combined with higher employability, that might make it easier for them to find work, uh, to find better paying jobs. Now, this is gonna be a, a medium term study. We're gonna look over the period of about one year. And so we're not gonna be able to speak to that long term mechanism. But what we can hypothesize is that still, being in the workforce, being exposed to formal sector employment, meeting people, forming social connections, that in itself might help people find more formal work opportunities. And so that's something we're gonna test as well. So our research design is a randomized controlled trial. And the idea here is that we're going to try to take new SPES eligible applicants. So these are youth between ages 15 to 25 who had never participated in SPES before who were deemed to be eligible in the sense that they met the income requirements. They had to be from relatively poor families. And essentially what we did is we, in municipalities where there were more people than there were slots, we randomly split them into two different groups. Now the reason for doing this was that our hope was that these two groups would be comparable on all other factors except whether or not they were offered best. So, if we were just comparing a before versus after, other things could have happened. Students get older, they get more mature. If we were to compare people who do and do not receive SPES, one of the questions is, you know, what are those other factors that, that determine whether someone receives SPES? Maybe they enroll in SPES because they're more motivated, and that affects their success. But here, because we use a lottery structure, those two groups should be, on average, comparable. So what we did is some of those students were offered SPES, some were not. And then eight to 12 months later, we measured their education, their employability, and their employment to answer our research questions. And any differences we see between those two groups, we're going to attribute to being the result of SPES as opposed to the result of some other outside factors. So this research took place throughout 2016 and into 2017. And it's important to keep this in mind because there are a few outside events that are worth highlighting. So in early 2016, we began baseline data collection during the SPES application period. So SPES operates primarily during summer break. So after school lets out in March until about June when school starts back up again. And what we did is we worked with the local PESOs to collect both the application information that students fill out about their backgrounds and then also to collect some supplemental data about their own aspirations, their work experience, their educational histories, and so on. We collected and encoded this data um, during the time that SPES was actually implemented. So when municipalities agreed to participate, they sent us their list of applicants, and we randomized them into some receiving SPES and some not receiving SPES. Then during the summer, that's when SPES actually took place, People were informed that they'd been selected for SPES, they worked their jobs, they earned their money. And the other thing that's important to note during this period is the 2016 elections happened. Um, we'll talk about more what that means, 
But at a minimum, what it means is that during the recruitment process, the mayors who are very involved in this program, because that's where the students are working, they are very interested in SPES, because it's something that's very important to, um, it's an important program that they're administering from their own end. So we also conducted a process evaluation, that is we interviewed local PESO managers, and we learned more about exactly how the program works. So even though it's a national program, even though there are implementing guidelines for who is eligible, how many days of work they should have, each PESO has its own local contexts, its own beneficiaries, its own needs, and so what we learned is that the, the program is implemented differently, a little bit differently in every context. The academic school year ran from about June to March 2017, and it's during this time that we're trying to look to see what the impact of SPES is. So we entered our data, collected information, and then we followed up with students in early 2017. Now here we did a phone survey. It was too expensive to go find all the students again. Um, so we just called them up and asked them, are you working? Are you in school? What are you doing? And that's how we basically generate our, our end line outcomes. So what we're gonna be looking at when we think about the impact of SPES is relative to where students were at the beginning of 2016, how different were their lives in 2017, and were they likely to be very different between the control group and the treatment group? Those who were invited to receive SPES and those who were not invited to receive SPES. It was important to us to include a range of regions. Um, we wanted to include both areas from Luzon, from Visayas, from Mindanao. And so we targeted regions 3, 6, 7, 11, and NCR to get sort of a wide range. Uh, but we also had some challenges in recruiting municipalities. And so ultimately, we're focusing on just three regions. Uh, specifically regions three, NCR, and region 11, which are highlighted in blue. All right, so now's the part where we reflect. Um, you may have some ideas of what might have gone wrong here. Um, as we mentioned, it's an election year. We're working across a range of municipalities and uh, K-12 implementation is going to happen too, right? So there are some big challenges coming up. <laughs> and the three areas where we had these challenges were first in, in recruiting pesos, getting them to actually participate in our study. One thing you've noticed is that not all of our regions are blue. There's a reason for that. The second thing we had challenges with was collecting data. We had to collect baseline data across a wide range of provinces and municipalities, and then we had to find students again by phone. And then the third challenge we had was ensuring treatment compliance, which is to say, when we ask the PESO very nicely to please make sure that these students received SPES and these students didn't, what, were the, what actually happened? Did that actually happen, right? We're, we are not the PESO, we are an outside group giving them instructions it's not always clear that there's going to be a perfect compliance. So let's dive in. Okay, so challenges with recruiting pesos. So this is a challenge anytime you have a lot of very different groups of individuals with different agendas, and their agendas may not be the same as your agenda. So the first challenge we had was that 2016 was when national and local elections came in. And we really had two choices. So one option was we, we suspect that there was going to be problems attracting applicants, um, attracting pesos to participate in our study because the mayors are very involved in the program since they hire a lot of the workers. And so we thought, well, do we risk delaying the project? Now, doing so would avoid the election, but also could risk cancellation depending on how the new administration felt. The other option was to push through and to expect resistance from the mayors. Now, ultimately, the election cycle, right, is for mayors every three years. So our, our decision was actually to continue to push forward um, with the idea that, in a way, these electoral concerns, while they might be heightened in 2016, they're still not going to go away. So we decided that was something we were going to try to work with, um, which I think turned out to be the right decision. Um, the second challenge we had was that there were communication difficulties between the regional and the local level pesos. 
So to provide a bit of context, the, the regional offices report to the national dole. But the local pesos at the municipal level, those managers are appointed by the mayors. And so they're accountable to the mayor. And so it was very easy for us to say, OK, well, we'll talk, we'll get buy-in from the national level, from the regional level. Everyone's on board. But it was very difficult sometimes for the regional offices to communicate to the municipal offices and to actually ensure that their directives were followed. So what that meant was that, one, what the regional offices wanted to happen didn't always happen. And two, what the regional offices were told was not always what actually happened. So this was one challenge we had when we were, basically the, the local level peso said, oh, we'll start recruiting in February, we'll start recruiting in March. That's what they told their regional offices, but they actually started recruiting in January. Whether this was miscommunication or some other issue, we don't know, but certainly there was a bit of a break, and that was something we had to be sensitive to. And then the third challenge we had in recruitment was this local perception of impact evaluation as essentially an audit. So one of the things we learned when we started getting some pushback from the local level was that for many of the PESO managers, they viewed us coming in, collecting their data, learning what the impact of SPES is, they viewed that as us trying to tell them whether or not they were doing a good job. And that is something that, you know, as a, as a manager, makes you feel very vulnerable um, and isn't necessarily very welcomed. So, and, and furthermore, it was not what we were doing. We were not actually measuring their performance. This was not a performance evaluation. This was an impact evaluation. And so what we wanted to know is when everything goes well, what does the program do? Whereas a lot of the managers thought we were asking, is everything going well? And that was a different question. And so it was really important for us to communicate that. Um, and in a perfect world, we would have communicated that even earlier. So a few things we did that worked well was that because we were going to have a challenge to recruiting, we had an extensive backup list of pesos. So once we received some rejections, there were other pesos we could go to, and we had basically randomized the order, so we weren't just picking sort of the biggest to smallest, or the most cooperative to least cooperative. So that was a, a really nice thing that we had done. And the other thing we did that really helped was to do direct outreach to local offices. So once we knew there was a problem and we could reach out and communicate with them directly, we could address a lot of those concerns about whether or not we're actually auditing them. But we needed a face-to-face, -face, a personal interaction. And it took us time to, to build that relationship. And it was also important that we do it with the support of the regional offices, right? Because the regional offices were also very invested. So we had to make sure that everyone was informed. The other thing we did was we had intended to limit our control group to two years, but because of feedback from the PESOs, they said, look, we can't withhold people from SPES for two years, but we can do one. That was something that enabled us to get more buy-in, where we said, okay, that's reasonable. We can work with that. So we needed to adjust our study design to reflect the concerns of the local level PESOs. So those were things that we did that worked well. Now, there's also things that we could have done better. We could have had more regions, right? What ended up happening, if we go back to our map, is that in these areas, these orange areas, specifically region six and seven, there wasn't enough interest and support. And there was also something of a, kind of once, once one peso agreed, then other pesos would agree. Once one peso disagreed, then other pesos would disagree. And so we kind of had sort of like a, a first mover problem. We needed someone in region six or someone in region seven to just like take the plunge and be the example to be a partner with us. And they were very willing and cooperative to help us do the evaluation, but to get that oversubscription is where we still had some challenges. And so if we had had more regions, we would have had a little bit just more options for when we had additional resistance. So that was one thing that we wished had been better. And we, we wished we would have had a better oriented the local vessels, right? We were able to respond to their concerns, but only after we started getting pushback. And if we had been able to, from the very start, be aware of this perception of auditing, be aware of some of their concerns, we would have been able to address them more quickly. And similarly, we needed to reach out to them more quickly. By the time we were able to work with them, a lot had already started their application process. Um, so that was something where, you know, doing this again, we would have started even earlier with more direct outreach. The second challenge we had was that even when PESOS did support us, so in Region 6 and 7, we had some PESOS who were willing to participate in the data collection, 
there was strong resistance to oversubscription. And the idea was that what they usually did was first come, first serve. They would let everyone come in, and then once they were full, they would shut down the program. Okay? And that way, no one was ever turned away, was the idea. Now, in effect, people were still turned away. It was just they never got to apply. So it didn't feel bad when you turned them away, because you just said the application was closed. And so what we had needed was either greater buy-in to allow additional people to come in to extend the enrollment period, or stronger accountability, where we had been able to have someone from the regional office be able to enforce a policy of having a, lo a longer, broader enrollment period. Um, as a result, we also saw resistance when we tried to coordinate advertising efforts, saying, look, we're not getting enough interest in region six and seven, not enough people are enrolling, we're not gonna be able to randomize, because we're just not getting more people than we have slots. But there was a lot of resistance to doing advertising, with the idea that if we advertise, we advertise, then we'll disappoint people. And so that was something that was a, that was really a big challenge. And one thing that, you know, we kind of thought, hey, we had done the work on explaining randomization, or whether it was fair, we had buy-in, but we hadn't really thought about whether or not that was enough to even want to allow more people in the program. So in order to get that support, that's where we were, we were struggling a little bit. I think in the future, situations like this are where sort of national and regional advertising efforts may have been helpful. That even if the local levels were, were hesitant, we might have been able to use sort of a higher level of government to advertise the program as a way of encouraging oversubscription. Um, it does mean that simply from a, from a program perspective, having clear enrollment periods that can be identified and shared with the public may be more effective to bring in a wider range of people. <coughs> One thing that happened in this sort of first come, first serve mentality is that if you heard about the program, it was because you had a friend, a neighbor, a relative who worked in the mayor's office, which kept the population reached by SPES very narrow, because essentially it was those who already had some So what you can see in terms of the impact that these challenges had was that we were able to bring in 22 pesos to participate in our impact evaluation, um, which is the far right column, distributed across regions 3, 11, and NCR. But this was out of, we started with 84. We were really only able to get 24%, 26% of, um, of the pesos that we tried. Now that said, we were able to get pretty good cooperation in terms of data collection. Local areas were willing to work with us to, to take extra administrative burdens on in terms of collecting data. It was just that part where either agreeing to participate in the impact evaluation, we were down to 30, and then we were down to 22 because they didn't all achieve <coughs> oversubscription, so there was nothing to randomize. Okay, so the next thing we had to do was, was our data collection at baseline. And here's where I think there also were lessons that would be useful for a more general context as well. So we had two types of data. The first type of data we had was data about applications. So, the, sorry, administrative data that comes from the application form. And the second type of data was data that we collected as IPA. This was through surveys that we asked the respondents to fill out. Um, and then we also had a, a checklist that we asked the PESO officers to fill out to check to make sure everything was was fine. And so, in theory, this is what we thought was going to happen. We thought, okay, great, applicants will visit the offices, they'll fill out their forms, because they have to fill out one, the other one's right next to it, so why not? And then the PESO officer will verify it, make sure it's all right, fix any errors. We'll check on them every so often, make sure everyone's okay. Then someone will encode it, maybe we'll encode it, maybe the PESO office will encode it. Then we'll match the records all together, and we'll have a beautiful data be wonderful. Um, that didn't happen. <laughs> Spoilers. So here's what happened. First of all, some places started early. This was a miscommunication issue. Some places started collecting their applications before they told their regional offices they were going to. Then, some pesos actually fill out their forms after they choose their beneficiaries. So what they do is they say, okay, great, you're a beneficiary. Excellent, come fill out this form. The idea is that then people don't fill out forms and have the disappointment of not being selected. But the challenge is, if we actually tried to collect those forms, there were no forms because they hadn't selected them. So that was a challenge. 
Applicants left parts of their forms blank. Sometimes all parts of their forms were blank. <laughs> Sometimes the pencil officer verification forms were blank. And there were also inaccuracies and missing data in administrative forms. So it wasn't just, we thought, you know, maybe they just don't take R seriously. Because we made it look really official, but maybe it wasn't. Um, but even the Form 2s, the forms that are the SPAS application form, we still had problems with missing phone numbers, missing addresses, missing ages, missing grade levels. Um, and that's before we even get started with the spellings, because that's a unique and special challenge. So we learned some things. A few things that we took away from the perspective of being a researcher was that it would have been useful and worth the extra expense to have our own staff on site from the beginning. We thought self-administered surveys would be a way to bring down costs. It did. It was very cheap. It was very cheap to collect incomplete data. <laughs> it would have been better to have more expensive complete data. So now, now you've learned that. And you can do that instead of us. Um, the second thing that might have been helpful was to coordinate essentially application days as a way of bringing the cost down. This is in effect what a lot of the pesos do anyways. They know it's costly to sit and have people fill out forms, so often they open their application for only a few days. We could have worked with that and they made that part of the process as a way of collecting all the information at once, verifying that it's complete, and letting it go into our coding and our files. And thirdly, we had to be, we, we over-relied on the administrative data. We heard the word administrative, we thought, ah, it's perfect, right? But administrative data does not mean accurate data. It just means that it was collected by administrators. And so that requires students to fill out forms accurately and completely, and if they don't, to be checked. And that wasn't always the case. And so one particular example that we had was that we didn't collect addresses because they were on the administrative forms, and we thought it would be double counting. We really needed to have either A, verified those administrative forms ourselves, or B, collected that data ourselves. That was one of the, the weaknesses we had. From a policy perspective, there were also things that I thought were, that were useful takeaways. So increased data sharing with higher levels would have been really important, because one thing, one reason we didn't know about these challenges was because the regional offices didn't know, because they never saw this data. It never left the municipal levels. Um, Additionally, there may be room for developing better encoding and data management systems to minimize the burdens. Encoding all this data for you know, some of the massive, especially in NCR, these are massive programs with thousands and thousands of applicants. One thing some regions, including Region 11, do is they use online forms. So the students enter their data, there's nothing to encode. It's already there. Um, there may be ways to create incentives for people to produce high quality data, right? The incentive of the pesos to fill out these forms accurately is relatively little. No one's checking on them. No one's going to get them in trouble if it's not complete. So there's no consequence. Um, we also thought there might be a role for Facebook. So one challenge we had is that people change phone numbers constantly. <coughs> Students are a mobile population. They're not always living with their parents. They often move, often to the capital. Um, but they always stay on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so there may be room there for pesos to develop better communication. I mean, one challenge we had, which I'll come to later, is that sometimes pesos couldn't find their beneficiaries to pay them. Their numbers had changed, and they weren't living at home. They couldn't send out smoke signals. They needed some way to find them if they had a Facebook group, actually. That, that might be an OK way to find people. In terms of endline, endline presented a whole other set of challenges. Sorry, this is just, it's just the part where I can um, so for NLIN, we had two sources of data. We had one, administrative data, and these are terminal reports. And these are the reports that are required to be passed up from the local level up to the regional offices. It includes name, number of days worked, and earnings. So very minimal, but, but it does get shared. And then we did a phone survey to get information on people's education status, employment status, employability, and experience with SPES. So you can see here, we kind of set up a little call center started calling people. When we couldn't find them, we hunted them down, but like in a nice way. So here we are out finding people. So there were a few things we did that helped this work, right? So we were, we, we knew this was going to be a challenge, right? Students change numbers all the time. Um, a lot of people are out of network. 
network, particularly if they live in more mountainous areas, more rural areas. Um, people are busy. So there were a few things we did really right that we were quite proud of. So first, uh, there are multiple phone numbers. We collected a respondent number, an alternate number, three family member numbers, and a friend. Uh, that wasn't always enough. <laughs> but it worked pretty well. Um, we texted before we started calling them to say, hey, we're going to call you. Just, you know, so that way they don't just see a random number and figure it's a scam. Um, and the text said, you know, hi, we're from IPA. We're going to do a survey. We'll give you some phone load. Um, and then we also texted after several missed calls to say, hey, we're really IPA. We'll give you some phone load. And then we, we, um, we started calling harassing, mostly calling politely their family and friends to ask for updated numbers. So we basically had a multi-pronged strategy. Um, we also tried email. Some people reported their email addresses. This was not effective. Our response rate was zero. <laughs> Actually zero, not zero percent, zero. Um, but our phone numbers were great, we got 75%. So, what our takeaways here were that actually for a phone survey, this is pretty good. 75% response just on phone calls. Much cheaper than finding people. Much quicker. Um, very practical when working across a lot of different regions. Don't bother with the email. Just don't. Um, but we, we still weren't quite happy with that. So this is what we did. We went to, we also combined these phone efforts we said, okay, we got 75%. Let's take the remaining quarter and let's find them harder. So what we did was we, we did two types of intensive follow-up efforts. The first thing is we, we hired someone to go on Facebook and try to look for everyone. <laughs> um, this, was, this was moderately effective. Uh, there were some challenges. A lot of people don't use their real names on Facebook. <laughs> uh, and, and again, had we foreseen this, we could have asked. Exactly, like what nickname, oh. combo do you use? Do you use your middle name as your last name? Or something like that. But we, we found people, and we didn't survey them by Facebook. We just asked for contact information and followed them up by phone. And then we also did field visits. So we coordinated with local pesos and said, hey, here are some people we can't find in your municipality. Please help. And in smaller municipalities, they could, because they, they knew ways to reach out to them. Either they had updated phone numbers, they had addresses that we didn't have, maybe they knew the body guy captains, they could contact and ask them to come in. And then finally, we also just went to people's houses and surveyed them. Um, altogether, this was obviously more expensive, but we didn't have to do it for 75% of our sample. So this brought down our cost dramatically, right? So we kind of did all the easy to find people first, then came back and did the harder ones. Overall, this got a response rate up to 86%. Effectively, it means we had a response rate of just shy of 50% using this method. So we found about half of the hard to find people. Not everyone, but a lot better than had we not tried it at all. So that was something we thought was really, we were pretty pleased with. And I think going forward, we would do this type of sort of multi-faceted approach again. Um, but then we had one more problem. And this is my last problem. And this is that we, we surveyed our 86% of people. We asked them if they enrolled in SPES or not. And we, we had in our mind a picture, right, which is that this blue, we have a, no, we don't have that. Oh, kind of. Oh, I didn't like it. Okay. We have this blue line, which is the rate of SPES enrollment if you're in the control group, right? And that should be zero, because they were not invited to SPES. And then we have that orange bar, which is the treatment. And that should be the likelihood that they did do SPES. And that should be about 100%. Now, maybe not, right? Some people might have changed their mind at the last minute. Something else came up. Um, maybe they, they never were able to be found. So maybe not 100, maybe 90, 95. Now, what you can see here is that that's not quite what we have. Our, our orange lines look pretty good. Our orange lines are about 90%. So that's, that's pretty good. We had some people drop out. Uh, but not, not a ton. But we also have pretty substantial non-compliance in our control group. So what that means is that somewhere down the line, somebody snuck in the SPES. Uh, and you can see there's some, some pretty substantial regions.
regional variation. So region three, actually about half, not great. Um, region 11 had really high compliance, only 20%, and NCR about 37. So there are some reasons people would sneak in that we would not consider a problem. So, ooh, ah, okay. um, so one reason people would sneak in is simply that someone in that treatment group declined. They said, oh, I'm, I'm busy, I'm sorry. And the, so then the, the officers pulled someone else from the control group just to fill the slot, right? That's gonna happen, we're, we're used to that. Um, if ten, but clearly that's not quite what's happening. There's too much non-compliance. And so what our takeaways here are that, one, some places the, they just ignored the list. Some places the mayor said, oh, I have a priority list that the professors didn't know about. And so they were able to do their job, but then this priority list kind of kicked some people out. So what that means is that we have some imperfect compliance. And so we have on average about 75% of compliance, but in some municipalities, we have rates of compliance that are lower than 50%. That's not good. Um, again, we also thought that maybe what happened is that they had a separate batch for the control group and let them sneak in later. But most, most places only had one batch per year. So we don't think that was very likely. It's more likely that they were just ignoring, ignoring things. So from a, a perspective of whether our study is still valid, this doesn't actually present a problem. We could look at our intention to treat effects. That is, we can look at the impact of being assigned to receive specs, and that's, nobody's manipulated with that. That's still random. We can adjust our estimates using instrumental variables to basically look at the impact of specs for those who were induced to receive it. Basically, those who were moved from not receiving it to receiving it, we can look at the impact for them. So we can basically scale up our estimates by this non-compliance rate. Um, that's a fine way to fix it, that's what we're gonna do, but it does reduce our power. So that was one of the challenges we had. And it also raised for us this question about, you know, what incentives do PESOS have to comply? And I think that's something worth thinking about for future research on this topic or other topics, is that for the PESOS to do this, they have to have a reason to go along with it, right? This is one reason why public lotteries are often quite popular. Not only can you not accuse the researchers of cheating, but it does create an incentive, right? Had we been able to do a public lottery, which in this context I don't think would have worked out, probably not. But had we been able to, um, that would be a situation where there'd be public pressure. You know, once your name is pulled out and you're, you know, you're the chosen person, if you don't get your program, that's going to look bad. That's going to create a problem. So there's other ways to create incentives, and in our case, there wasn't a strong incentive. So now I'm going to talk about the targeting and the results, and then we'll come back to our lessons learned. So one thing that's important about SPES that requires thinking about is that the purpose of the program is to reach the poor but deserving youth. Okay, so the poor part is a little bit tricky, because what does it mean to be poor, right? There's different thresholds, um, there's different guidelines. And then the deserving, that's a whole other part, right? Do we mean the most motivated? Do we mean the students who are most needing of the help? Do we mean the students who really are relying on it, or the students with the highest grades, right? So this is something that um, is, is currently being debated and thought about, um, but, but does lead, led us to ask sort of who are the people we're reaching. So even though SPES is targeting students ages 15 to 25, nearly all of our applicants are under 20, 20 or younger. Um, essentially, these are first time applicants, but the 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, most of those students are not enrolled in so essentially, they're not usually still in school at this point. They're doing something else, and so SPES isn't that appealing. So when we think about the challenges and whether SPES is helping, we're going to be thinking about relatively young students. We also saw that in terms of grade levels, most of the applicants we're working with were either grade 11 or second year of college. Now, this weird gap in between is partially because of K-12. So this is last academic year there was no grade 12, um, and there was no first year college because everyone had been held back to get their two extra years. So this will not look like SPES applicants this year, and it will not look like SPES applicants next year. It should look more normal. Um, but the key thing to take away is that there's not a lot of very young applicants. They're not showing up in grade 10. And there's not a lot at the very end. 
so people in their last year of college, that's, there's not a ton. The other thing that's worth noting is that enrollment is really high. So this is students who, you know, they were probably enrolled at the beginning, before their summer break. Did they come back? Did they come back to school? And of them, about 94% did come back. So enrollment rates are high in this population. The other thing to note, and this is important given the current discussion about free tuition, right? One concern is, as should free tuition come into play, what does that mean for SPECs, right? It's providing financial assistance to students who now don't have tuition in college, and in public schools don't have tuition in public schools. Um, what we see is that there's actually quite a lot of beneficiaries who attend private or semi-private schools. So about nearly a third are paying tuition for that. We find that SPECs applicants, consistent with the poor part, are relatively poor, but certainly not the poorest of the poor. We had a hard time trying to actually quantify this, because um, it's difficult to ask a 16-year-old to describe their parents' irregular earnings, right? It's, it's hard to quantify. Um, but we used a few different methods. Um, one method we looked at, very straightforward, is just, is your family a 4Ps beneficiary? It's a pretty solid way to measure whether or not your family's poor. And about a quarter of students were 4Ps beneficiaries. The other way we did it was we used the Progress Out of Poverty Index, which basically is a series of eight questions um, that's related to the Family Income and Expenditure Survey. And through these eight questions, we can get a sense, approximately, of how likely someone's family is to be poor. And when we use that, we find that very, very, very few are likely to be, be below the poverty rate, poverty line in the Philippines. So this is the 2009 line of about 50 pesos per person per day. Very few people were that poor. But most, 63%, were, were below about 200% of the poverty rate. So these are students whose families are, are struggling, but not the extreme poor. We also had some qualitative evidence about what might be going on, that we have students who are relatively young, relatively poor, not the poorest, very likely to be enrolled in school. You know, sort of why why are we getting this sort of makeup of students? And, and this is where some qualitative evidence and came from our process evaluation, our conversations with, the, with um, implementers, that was really useful to complement our quantitative evidence. And what we found was that, indeed, there's significant, significant mayoral involvement. One thing, as I mentioned, is that we see short application periods with minimal advertising, which allows students who are ha that have some connections to continue to enroll in the program. In some cases, applications were just distributed through the bottom guy captains. So you actually couldn't even go to your casa to get an application. Your, your bottom guy captain had to basically select you to receive an application. Many, more than a third, were asked to show voters' IDs or the IDs of their parents. So this is consistent with mayors using it as a result, as a way to short political support. Now that said, voter IDs are a way to show your residency as well, so that could be one of the motivations for it. But at the same time, there's lots of other ways to show residency. And in the law, voter IDs are not required. So it really was something that had emerged. And then finally, in some municipalities, mayors just provide a list of beneficiaries. They just say, here are the beneficiaries I want. And so it might not be surprising that we're not reaching the poorest of the poor, um, because those aren't the students that have the So the question that we're asking and trying to think about is sort of how to align these incentives between the national level, which is to find the poor but deserving youth, and the local level, which is to help shore up mayoral support. And so thinking about those incentives is a, is a challenge that we're, we're thinking about going forward. Okay. What it means also is thinking more about who's this poor and who are the deserving, right? In terms of poor, we, experienced, we saw some places actually prioritize 4P beneficiaries because they said, hey, you are the poor, you need our help. But yet in other places, they actually preferred to exclude the 4Ps because the, uh, the thought was they are already receiving help, they don't need more help. So either argument can be made, but it's currently being done at a municipal level, that each peso is making its own decisions. Some One thing you can do is you can show your um, exemption Certificate that your family income is so low you don't need to file with BIR or a certificate of indigency. But sometimes getting those documents requires a certain level of either um, time 
or savviness of the process, and so that also could be a barrier. And then in terms of deserving, there's substantial disagreement at a municipal level about who that is. There are some areas that implement their own tests or interviews to determine who the most motivated are. But again, are, for those most motivated, it's not always clear that they're on the margin of participating, of enrolling, right? If I'm a motivated student who's gonna find a way to get an education no matter what, that's gonna be really important to me. It might really help me make my life better, but it's not gonna influence my education decision because I'm gonna find a way to make it work. Currently, SPES requires that you have a passing grade weighted average, but again, those are means you're gonna have, on the one hand, it means you can continue in school, on the other hand, it means you're gonna get higher achievers. Um, the same idea is that for out of school youth, they have to be deemed as having some good moral character. On the one hand, this might be a good screening, on the other hand, it might restrict people who might benefit from the program. So it's just something to think about in terms of when we shape programs, who exactly are we targeting? And are the people we're reaching the same as the ones we want to reach? All right, so in the last about 20 minutes, I'll share the findings of the results across our three domains. So in terms of education, we have a few main takeaways. The first is that with or without SPES, enrollment rates are high, they're about 94%. We don't see any impact of SPES on school enrollment, um, but partially there's not a lot of room, right? A 95% enrollment rate, most people are already staying in school. We do see that SPES increases enrollment for men, and men are those who are at slightly higher risk of dropping out of school, and they also only make up about a third of SPES beneficiaries, so nearly two-thirds are female. We don't see any increase in college graduation rates. Um, we can't see an increase in high school graduation rates because in this year there is no high school graduating class, so that's not, there's not a lot of room to move there. And for those that did not enroll, the most common reason was financial problems. Nearly 60% said that they couldn't go on with their schooling because of financial problems. And that was true with or without SPES. A lot of people were saying that was why they had to drop out. You can see here how enrollment rates are persistently high. So the blue is the control rate, orange is treatment. And what you can see is that enrollment rates do fall as people get a little bit older. So year two of college is sort of 95 actually a little bit lower for treatment, but we don't see big increases overall. When we put that to a regression, these are, for my econometrics lovers, these are local average treatment effects. Um, essentially, this is the impact of actually enrolling in SPES for those who were able to enroll because of the randomization. And what you can see here is we don't see any change in enrollment um, overall. We see a slight decrease in graduation from high school, but again, there was no graduating class, so we're, we don't think this is actually a causal impact of the program. We see that there's a small enrollment, increase in enrollment among men, um, and it's not statistically different from women, um, except marginally, and we see the same increase that they're, they're more likely to say they're, they're gonna enroll next year. Finally, we see some evidence that, uh, well, we do see lower income students, sorry about the title here. High school students are slightly more likely to benefit from SPES, um, but again, these, these differences are not statistically significant. So we see high school students staying in higher, at higher rates, but again, it's not statistically significantly different than zero. And here you can see the reasons why people dropped out. Now some were not in school anymore because they had graduated, so that's, Great, like that's, that's our good dropout. They just, there's no more school for them. Um, but the main thing that we see is people could not afford to continue. And you can see actually between the treatment and control group, it's not the case that that's lower for treatment group. So it, it isn't the case that um, not only is that not increasing enrollment, it's not, for those who did drop out, it's not affecting their reasons why. Okay, so we had questions about why, why this might be. I think we've talked about a lot of them already, but to summarize, we had high enrollment to begin with. In terms of our time frame, the school year had not ended for many, and we're not gonna be able to look at graduation impacts because it's further along. We may see 
greater attrition in the following school year, but we weren't able to get that far because of the challenges with the control group. So that's possible. And then finally, for high school graduation, it just was a year where we didn't see high school graduates. But certainly, you have to have a difference in enrollment to see a difference in graduation, and so we don't see the difference in enrollment. We next look at the impact on employability. Things aren't great. I could summarize the next few slides by just saying we don't see impacts. <laughs> but it, we'll, take it, we'll take the slow route. Um, so we see that SPES participants do a variety of office tasks. Most are working in their LGUs, most are doing office work, but they're not gaining any skills except for experience answering phones. Just something. Um, part of it is that part of it is that our, our participants actually have pretty good work skills in general. A lot have experience working with office. A lot have experience in coding. Um, we don't see any impacts on self-esteem. We don't see any impacts on self-reported life skills using the Bureau of Local Employment Instruments. We see students having more confidence about their work prospects after graduation. That is, they think it's more likely they'll be able to find a job. But we don't see any perception changes in their wage perceptions. <clears throat> so we'll unpack this a little bit. So here, I've broken everything into four distinct areas using different indices. So the first index is a measure of student self-esteem. And I've normalized this. So essentially, one unit is one standard deviation more self-esteem. And what you can see is that there's no emotion here on self-esteem. Students are equally confident in their self-worth, with or without stress. In terms of work tasks, here I summed up the number of students who said they had experience doing various work tasks. This could include answering phones, which did move, um, using PowerPoint, using Excel, using Word, encoding data, making copies, scanning, um, organizing files. I Ones. There were 11. We normalized those. We don't see any motion there. There's no overall increase in work tasks. We used two measures of life skills and workplace skills. One was using the BLE Life Skills Index. One was using a measure of personal and social competencies, sort of showing team building skills, leadership skills, those sorts of things. We normalized those. So again, a one unit increase is one standard deviation. And you can see there's, there's nothing. The estimates are close to zero, and they're imprecise. We do see that SPES beneficiaries are more confident in their ability to find a job. On average, 65% of the control group said they would probably find a job within six months of graduating. And that went up by about 10 percentage points as a result of enrolling in SPES. So from about 65% to 75%. So a pretty big increase in confidence. And then we asked them about their lowest willing, their lowest wage they'd be willing to accept, um, their expected wages they think they could earn, whether they whether they're going to finish college, just an aspirational question, and whether they're going to enroll in SPES next year. <clears throat> and we don't see any motion on any of these. Okay, and then our last domain is thinking about employment. Here's where we get our most encouraging results because we see that SPES participation increased the likelihood of being currently employed. Um, pretty substantially. Basically, it's a 70% it's a increase because the employment rates are pretty low. Um, but what it does mean is that for every 100 SPES beneficiaries, four are moved into employment because of SPES. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty good size for a short program. We also see that without SPES, very few applicants would have worked during the summer. So SPES isn't really substituting very much for other outside employment. Most people were not going to be working. So it is providing employment opportunities for those who would not have otherwise had them. So you can see here, from people enrolled in SPES, they're about four percentage points more likely to be working. No change in job search and no change in earnings. And these are earnings conditional on work. So it's not that the students are just taking more jobs that pay worse. They're just taking more jobs that pay about the same. Um, so that, that we saw is pretty encouraging. Again, these are big estimates because on average, only about 6% of the control group we looked into a little bit, you know, are these people continuing with their special jobs? Is it, you know, did, did the employer, you know, the mayor like them so much they kept them on? It doesn't seem to be the case. And these jobs, most of them are in the private sector. Most of them are not through SPES. 
So, and we, and we can also rule out, um, what was the other one we had thought about? So it wasn't that, and it wasn't the case that students were um, dropping out of school in mass to go take their jobs. So people who were working were more likely to not be in school, but a lot of them were working and in school. So there's a lot of, some of this is also part-time work students are picking up. So this to us suggests a potential role for, for perhaps social connections that were made or just increased exposure to the labor market, but we aren't, we aren't able to, to, hold that, to identify that precisely because we can't really unpack So what we see overall is we see big increases, pretty big increases in employment, we see nothing in education, we see nothing in employability. So then our question is how cost effective is this? So even though we don't see estimates, don't, even though we don't see impacts in terms of education, we can still take that value, right? It's still a, it's about a 1.6 percentage point increase in enrollment. It's not significant, but we can take it seriously. So what we see is that it's best costs about 3,500 pesos per beneficiary. Now it's worth noting, this is the cost of Dole, right? This is not the cost overall, because if Dole is chipping in 40%, that's gonna cover, that's gonna be in there, plus all the administrative costs. But it's not gonna include the 60% counterpart. So we need to almost double that. And a lot of this money goes straight to the beneficiary. So there also is a benefit from helping students. And if you talk to students, which we did, they use the money to pay for their education, but also to pay for their siblings' education, to help at home, um, to pay for extracurriculars, they were out to save. There was a lot of use that people use. So this money is not, you know, it's not just going in the trash, right? It's, it's being used. But the question is, what is the education kind of bang for the buck that we get? What do we get out of this? So if we take seriously our education numbers, for every 100 SPES beneficiaries, about 1.6 are prevented from dropping out of school. Now that's not great for cost effectiveness because that means that the cost to dole alone per dropout is over 200,000 pesos, which is high. Um, now that said, given a 95% enrollment rate, even if we got everybody in the school, even if every single person who would have dropped out was prevented because of stress, this would still be very expensive. It would still cost about 62,000 pesos per dropout. And the reason is that there are so many people in this program who are gonna enroll no matter what. When you're a control group, 94% enroll, there's just a lot of people who are gonna stay in school. They're not, a lot of them are not on the margin of dropping out. We also see better results in terms of work. For every 100 SPES beneficiaries, about four are moved into work, and that's at a cost of about 100,000 pesos, 90,000 pesos per eventual job found. So, expensive. Now, one of the reasons why we don't see a lot of effects here, we wanted to look into sort of, you know, what's going on. So we asked people, what did you do at SPES? And this is one of the clues that gave us insight into why we may not see big changes in employability, um, is that Students are engaged in office tasks, but a lot of them are not the most sort of meaningful office tasks. These are not work that's gonna be designed to improve their skills. So about 26% their main task was surveying, <clears throat> about 18% are encoding, filing and organizing, about 10% were you know, cleaning, sweeping, planting. These are tasks, they would keep you busy, but they're not necessarily gonna be building skills. Right? Um, and we actually saw, here it's about 6% as their main task, but about 14% overall spent a, a substantial amount of time, what we described as maintaining the cleanliness and orderliness of the office, effectively moving chairs around, opening and closing the windows. <laughs> Things that, that not only don't build skill, but skills, but also aren't remotely interesting or occupying, right? So there's, again, that's only about 14%, that's not everyone, that's not even average, but it's a substantial number of students who aren't doing much and who could be put to better use. So given this, it wasn't surprising to us that maybe there wasn't a change in employability because why would there be, right? These, these types of tests aren't gonna be the ones that are going to improve their experience with you know, word processing or you know, maybe some encoding, but a lot of students already had encoding experience. So that's one of the, the reasons we had it. Now that said, people were very happy with this. This was okay. 
they still did it, right? So people's satisfaction, about 60% were very satisfied with their PESO, 72% was fast, 70% were satisfied with their tasks, and that's very satisfied, right? You can see the rates of dissatisfaction were very low. Um, so people don't mind, they still do it, they're just not necessarily getting the extra skills we might hope. Now the other thing we saw is that SPES is actually very short. So this is a program that's supposed to run from 20 to 52 days. And in fact, under the most recent implementing regulations, they expanded that from 20 to 78 days. However, we find that nearly all applicants are working just the minimum, the bare minimum of 20 days. And that's not because they don't want the extra work, it's because they're working for the local governments. The local governments want to help as many people as possible. And so with a fixed budget, they use the minimum number of days to help the maximum number of people. It's completely reasonable they would do this, but it means that the, the amount that they can actually work and what they can learn is relatively limited. And also the local office's capacity to find the meaningful things to do for that many students is also going to be taxed. It also means that over 20 days, your earnings, depending on your region, are between about 6,000 and 10,000. Now that's still a substantial amount of money, but compared to some of the reported out-of-pocket expenses, even when you set aside tuition, this was less than a lot of people's out-of-pocket expenses. So it may also be the case that for 20 days of work, that's just not enough money to meet all their educational needs. If you throw tuition in the mix, then it's even more challenging. Like I said, most are performing office work, um, and then about 14% are doing these sort of make-work tasks. They're just not particularly meaningful. So these things to us kind of, it made sense that we didn't see big effects. We have high numbers of enrollment, we see very short work periods, and we see a lot of tasks that aren't necessarily going to improve skills. Now that said, beneficiaries do put their, their resources to use in many different ways. A lot use it for tuition and school expenses, but they also use it to help support their families. So uh, there was one comes to mind, one applicant said that they use it to pay for her, her sister's school expenses, right? And so that's an important way that SPES may be helping that isn't captured in terms of educational outcomes. It's more of a welfare, right? People are better off, but not in these dimensions. Now that said, then the question is, you know, is and how can we make SPES be as effective as possible? And is that the intended effect? The other challenge we saw is we saw evidence of substantial payment delays. Now, um, Dole has been trying to address these, and, and some changes have been implemented already um, before we can even capture it. But what we see is that at end line, 14%, so 8 to 12 months after participating in SPES, 14% had not received their payments yet from Dole. They're 40%. It's hard for SPES to help you stay in, use your money to stay in school if you don't receive your money. So that was one of the challenges. Now that said, anecdotally, there was a lot of reasons for this. There were changes in administration as a result of the election. Students were hard to find. Um, some students didn't have all of their documents in order. And there were also just processing delays. So we're hoping to find out more about why these payment delays are. Um, ideally, people are supposed to be paid within one month. But as you can see, only about 30% were paid within one month. There's been a shift towards more cash payments away from vouchers that we're hoping will help speed this process up. Um, but again, there's going to need to be a lot of improvements here. Okay. So our specific findings are that SPES may be more effective as a work program than as an education program. We see higher cost effectiveness, we see higher effectiveness, but the costs are high, right? The cost per beneficiary is high. We also see that resolving payment delays are going to be essential to help students use earnings to fund their education. And we're really encouraged by the fact that Dole has been pursuing this in the past year. And there may be ways to help work experience provide students with more meaningful skills. When we talk to students, many of them were, in some small municipalities, engaged in really interesting things, helping out at Barangay Health Units, doing tutoring, um, things that might provide better skills, that might be more engaging, that might help the community more. But the scale of some of these programs is that it's not it's not able, so they end up being kind of housed, doing um, sort of routine office work in areas where they already have skills. 
Improved targeting may be really important. So again, we're not necessarily reaching the students who are most at risk of dropping out. We see that men, students from poorer families, and high school students get the best educational benefits. And so we might want to think about ways to bring those students in. We also might want to think about ways to bring in students who are less politically connected. That might be another area where there would be room for improvement. There may be room, we haven't tested it, but there may be room to help students build life skills. If helping improve their employability is a specific goal, we might want to just directly do that. Students are, in some ways, a captive audience. For 20 days a year, there may be room to provide some training to help them. And, find, and also, strengthening program monitoring and communication between regional and local ISOs is really essential. That's something that's challenging because the local officers are accountable to the mayor and not to the regional offices. Um, but at a minimum, improving monitoring data would be something that can be done within the current, the current framework. And then to wrap up, I just have a few lessons for researchers to some sort of my list of challenges and some of our solutions. Essentially, I think I have nine. I have nine lessons. And we learned nine things. The first thing is that getting that local buy-in was really hard, but really important, right? We, on the one hand, we saw high refusal rates because we didn't have the buy-in, but our ability to get it was essential in being able to still get those 22 pesos involved. We needed to have that buy-in. A lot of the mayors are sensitive to political concerns, but they also want to make sure their programs are working. And so through communication, we were able to, to convince them to work together with us. Um, so it was really important. The second was to remember that national directives don't always trickle all the way down to local offices, and information from local offices don't always trickle back up. That was something that it's really easy to kind of, you know, hope that it will work as it should, but it doesn't always. And being aware of those realities is important to keep in mind. Um, we did a process evaluation. If we could do it again, we would have done it even earlier. It was really, really helpful to get that qualitative information to help us interpret our findings, to help us understand the challenges and put, sort of add some color to, you know, when we see payment delays, why are we seeing these payment delays? When we're seeing, you know, students with high enrollment rates, why? Are the mayors actually being involved? I suspect so, but we can talk, we can ask people. Had we done a process evaluation, even at the planning stages, that would have shaped some of the questions we would have asked, and it would have been able to help us you know, have a more, just a deeper understanding. So a process evaluation is something that's expensive. It seems like, oh, maybe it's not essential to our impact evaluation, but in our case, it was really, really important that we did it, and if anything, we could have done it earlier. The other thing, which I already highlighted, was how important it was to differentiate between impact evaluation and performance monitoring. That in an ideal world, there would have been time for capacity <coughs> building and engaging with everybody at all levels. But because of people's schedules, that's not actually possible. So it was really important and would be important to the future to really focus on even if your local level pistol managers aren't 100% on board with RCTs, they need to know what our big picture objectives are. They we're trying to do an impact evaluation to know, does the program have make a difference? We're not trying to audit you. That was such, it was such a common misperception, and it was really hard to challenge. Or actually, I'm sorry, it wasn't hard to challenge. We just needed to tell them. But it's hard to challenge if you don't talk to people. <clears throat> finally, not finally, just five more here. Regional level, level advertising may be easier to coordinate than local level. We thought, oh, if we go to the most local level, that'll be easiest. We can work with people on the ground. But in some cases, especially for advertising, it would have been easier to just blanket everyone at a regional level because the local resistance, you can't, it's hard to say no to advertising. Like that's, it's just a hard thing to resist. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is that this project benefited a lot because we worked closely with ILS and they formed a technical working group with representatives from BLE, from ILS, from um, the regional offices, and the back and forth we had with that technical working group was really, really beneficial. It allowed us to not have five more pages of errors, right? Like There were many, many ideas we had that they could say, this isn't going to work. This is going to be a problem. Actually, we're interested in this question. 
And having that back and forth and having a, a designated group of people who were motivated and engaged in the process was really, really useful. Um, and I would, I would always do this going forward. We also saw really great leadership from the regional coordinators and regional offices. And when, when they were really motivated and had good communication with their local levels, it made a huge difference. We saw very different outcomes in terms of participation rates based on how effective those regional coordinators were. And when they were strong, everything came together beautifully. So that was really important. That kind of, that middle contact person was essential. Eight, administration, administrative data cannot be, is, can be unreliable. Administrative cannot be accurate. I feel like that's something I'm going to see in my sleep. Um, and then also the importance of getting multiple contact numbers was super, super good that we did. I wish we had had better address information. And again, I, I think there's real promise with some of the social networking sites, particularly Facebook, that don't change so much. Um, because once you lose people, if you only have their phone contact, you can't find them again. So that was something that we thought was something that worked really well. Um, I think if we did it again, we'd get six numbers. Just like, just just share your contacts with us. We'll just download your whole your whole identity, or maybe not. That might be hard to get approval. Okay. So for us, we're continuing to to work and hopefully partner with Dolly in future research. I think there were a lot of questions that this study raised. Right. It, we, we learned a lot about the limitations of SPES. It suggests a lot of ideas for tweaking the program. And so for us, we're thinking about, you know, what's the longer run impact of SPES? This is a one-year evaluation, but it'd be good to know, are there, are there longer run effects, particularly in the, in the realm of employment? Many of these students aren't going to see an employment effect because they're still full-time students. They're not working yet. And then what type of tweaks can we do to the program to make the program more effective, right? This is a big program. Changes are going to be slow in coming because they are off, they're administered through law, but there may be room for adding training components, looking at ways to improve the type of work experience, broadening recruitment, making applications easier, extending that minimum program length, um, and reducing payment delays through better administrative practices. Um, and then finally, you know, how do we align the incentives that the National Dole has with local governments, right? Regardless of you know, whether we could increase private participation, there still is gonna be a major role for the local, the national office to work with the local mayors because they're the major providers under this program. And to have an effective program, those incentives need to be aligned. And so there could be ways through additional monitoring, through additional local incentives, through additional advertising to help make sure that both parties are working towards, towards common goals. So this is where we're kind of heading in the future. And I think that, that wraps everything up. So. We have still some time for a discussion, right? All right. Thank you. Thank you for that very comprehensive presentation, Dr. Bean. Now we come to the open forum. Please state your name and, and, the, and your affiliation before asking the question. And uh, you can use the microphone at the back. Okay, so we would like to ask the first question. Yes, ma'am? study interesting, but maybe from that 
Your point of view. Um, or do all these points of view. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let me put it in the form of a question. Um, you observed that it had a significant, strong impact on um, on employment, right? And the form of the intervention underlying this whole thing is the wage subsidy. Okay, so this is related to the question. Now, for me, one interpretation of that effect and not the other effects is that the minimum wage, to the extent that, as we've shown in our study with Dr. Veta, has actually uh, a negative impact on employment, right? Uh, because um, it, it increases the cost of hiring people, particularly the impact is on the young, the inexperienced, those with low human capital, and women. So when you reduce the um, cost of the firm by this wage subsidy, then it is consistent that they're going to have an employment, increase in employment uh, take up by the firm. Is that a reasonable interpretation of your finding? Okay. Second is that um, I think when you look at the cost-benefit analysis, maybe it would be um, additionally instructive to look at the actually the, the economic cost, the real economic cost from the social standpoint. Because essentially the subsidy, to the extent that the, 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 the economic cost as, as opposed to financial cost, to do, totally, because the, the real economic cost is really the, the uh, uh, foregone uh, output that, that basically comes out because the student or the beneficiary is not working rather than doing something else, studying or another employment. So because financial uh, cost as transfers from the social point of view is just from one pocket to another pocket who are all members of the same society. In effect, if there are no linkages, there are no kind of um, um, uh, so-called with losses, then it's just zero, right? So I think it might be instructive because otherwise it could, if it's just the financial accounting, it could be misleading in making social decisions. The final comment is essentially, um, this is a, a, a comment which you may or may, or may, or may, or may not want to answer. Is that the four piece, the list Hanan, has been criticized, demonized by some critics, including those in Congress who are currently reviewing the desirability of defunding four piece in favor of so called livelihood uh, uh, initiatives or even issues of preclusion. Because, among others, it has, um, it is mistargeting. They're, they're not targeting apparent so-called the poor people because there are actually non-poor people, or those about the poverty life are included. But given the data that you have given me, there's no comparison that the whole piece of the list of Hanan is a far better way of targeting than than this, uh, this program. This is so targeting system is driven by mayors, as you put it, and other politicians. And I say this uh, because 
uh, in Congress in some of the hearings, some of the congressmen and the politicians were saying that they're better at targeting and identifying the poor people. I have many things here. So, you know, the, the, the first question was just, you know, sort of general, what's what's my recommendation, what would be our recommendation for the, the wage subsidy, sort of speaking more generally, right? So, <clears throat> I feel like we have some very specific recommendations that are, you know, well, that are well supported based on our quantitative and our qualitative evidence, and, and those are areas where I think there's real room for program experimentation, right? Now that said, it's also possible that there's at least a few people sitting in the room who are saying, well, therefore, just scrap all of SPES, throw it out the window. Um, I don't feel comfortable like, that I am someone who has the, who should say that, um, partially because there are limitations to our study, right? And a, a, a big change like that uh, requires, I think, just simply more, more evidence, right, about longer term impacts, about differences in program heterogeneity, right? And then, and then also going back to this idea of, you know, the economic, the economic cost, not just the accounting cost, right? So, you know, one question is what would be a better use of the funds? And is there a better use of the funds within this best framework? So for me, as a researcher, my question, you know, back, back to Dole and something we're discussing is sort of what is the goal here? Is the goal here to provide support to low-income students to help make their lives a little easier? If so, those should be our outcomes of interest. Is the goal to help students stay in school? Is there a way to make that more effective? Or by reaching students who are more on the margins of education? Or is the goal here to help students make easier labor market transitions? And if that's the case, then you know, that's where additional skills building and skills training may be more useful. One of the challenges where SPES is right now is it's trying to do, it's kind of doing a little bit of everything. And in, there may be some gains to, to thinking about how to improve it on the dimensions that are most important. So I think that's kind of where our study can be a starting point, is to think about what implementation adjustments can be made within this framework. Um, that said, if there is a better program that we know works, that has been tested and shown to have dramatic results, Maybe that's where we should invest, but that also requires us to have identified that easy win. And in this area of keeping kids in school and helping students find jobs, it's really hard to find those kinds of um, just amazingly successful programs. And so, you know, it, I think it's more constructive to work within the framework we have and try to make it better than just kind of throw everything out the window um, in the absence of something that that we do that we do know has been shown to to work. Um, but those ideas might emerge. Now, to the, the point about um, the impact on employment in the form of wage subsidies, I don't think, I think there's something to be said that when costs are hiring are higher, people hire less, right? And, and this debate about the impact of minimum wages and you know, how, how elastic is labor is really important and varies on contexts and certainly um, Definitely when people are hurt, it tends to be the youngest workers. Our results in terms of employment doesn't quite speak to that because we're looking at employment after the program ends. So certainly that students get employment because of the program, absolutely, right? The, there are private employers who hire because of that subsidy. And you know, when, when all students are 40% off, that's a great deal. Um, LGUs are hiring because they partially, because it's a little bit cheaper with the support. Though that said, some LGUs run their own programs and pay it all because they think that it's, it's a worthwhile program. Um, but when we see impacts in the medium run, eight to 12 months later, those students aren't, by and large, working with their best employers. So it hasn't been the case, the way some, some wage subsidy programs work, we hope is that it gets the firm to kind of take that risk, take a chance on the student, see that the student is a good investment and keep them on, or to see, oh, this wage subsidy persists, so I'm gonna keep employing them. The student should cost, at this point in time, should cost the same as any other worker. And in general, they're not employed with the same employer. So it has to be someone else came in. So the incentive wouldn't, wouldn't be there any longer. 
the question about the real economic costs, about thinking about economic versus accounting costs and what the opportunity cost is, I think that's important. Um, and I'll, I'll think about that in terms of our cost effectiveness calculations because if there's, there's two opportunity costs here, right? One's the opportunity cost of the funds, right? If we say this is the cost per, you know, we spend 3,500 pesos per student, it's not that that money would otherwise go nowhere, it would be used in some other program, right? And so then the question is, if there's something better, what is it? Which I don't know the answer to. But then similarly for students, if students are doing this, you know, what, is it, what else would they have been doing instead? What we do find, I didn't show the table for lack of time, is that most of the students weren't working somewhere else. There's some substitution. There are some students who would have worked jobs and instead got this best job. So there's some shifting there. But most students were not going to be employed um, when we look at the, the, the impacts there. And so that suggests to me that it's, it's a lot, it's not zero, but a no, lot, less. Oh, less. Less yeah, 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 a lot are not moving. It's summer break, they're not gonna be studying. A lot were not gonna be working. Maybe they would have been helping their families, but in general, it's a lot of idleness um, that would have been happening in the absence of spats by and large. So the opportunity cost there is relatively low. Um, and then finally, the, the issue about the um, list of and, and sort of how we think about targeting and perfections. Um, I, I don't know enough about the criticisms specifically in the four P's um, in terms of, you know, if we, the, the main question is, are we, are we for sure getting the poorest of the poor? And do we accidentally grab a few who are a little bit higher than we intend? Certainly, in this case, that's, we're not even close to that. Um, and, you know, and one thing to discuss is, you know, is something like a four piece list better? Now, now, the converse story is that here, right, we're also looking at high school and college students. And the poor to the poor might not have their children in high school or college. And so, particularly college, you might think that maybe the poor to the poor aren't going to benefit because they're not on the margin anyways. They really need everyone working and trying to help provide for the family. So maybe they would be a little bit less poor. Our hope is that with high school, at least, then we would really be able to bring in everyone, because I think that's similarly the goal of the four Ps. But yeah, I, I would say that this is not a story that political targeting is working well um, in, this, in this case. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for these are excellent comments. Again, let's have three questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Michael Friedman. Of Filipinos that they would sell their soul for the education of their children. 
Um, number two, uh, the objectives of the program according to Dole is um, to augment the family's income. Uh, and not necessarily on whether they will continue education. So, to augment the family's income. But the outcome is actually to finish the education first. So, number three, on, on, on the RQ1 schemes, uh, they, we, the, the research said that uh, people stay in school whether or not they are in the best program. However, we would also want to uh, highlight that the utilization of the funds was primarily for paying their tuition or their um, their family members' tuition, which actually um, positively correlates with the culture of Philippines. Really prioritize education. Um, my question is, is there a deeper analysis that um, they stay, but at the same time, um, the utilization of the funds was more on paying their tuition and augmenting some of the income of their family. Second would be, um, there is no significance between gaining skills and employability. Um, however, may I ask if there is any indication of an inculcation of culture of work with the beneficiaries. Not necessarily the skills per se, because we know that they might be given menial tasks because they might not be perceived as skilled by their employers. But did they observe how how to work? They observe the workplace, what culture they invite in the workplace that they can use in their future employment. And um, we would also want to um, highlight that the, the, there is a slight increase in the confidence of, of finding a job after the, the SPES program. Another is, is there a disaggregated data between the government and the private sector employment? Because we know that um, they would not be employed in the government anyway after the program. Because there is no opening or there are no additional funds because the election has been finished. But we, I would like to see certain data disaggregated on the private sector, whether the employers think that they would continue employing these um, children or these, these students. And, um, and, and I would like to see yun na, societal goal more than the financial cost benefit. Because bottom line, the objective of the program is actually to augment the income. The question is whether um, did the SPES program augment the income of these beneficiaries? And not necessarily on whether they stayed in school or not. So the cost benefit and the societal goals might be here. But all in all, it's a good research. And I would like to comment my Thank you. Would you like to answer? Oh, yes. Okay. I have a whole page now, so. Um, so thank you for those uh, those questions and those comments. So to think about what the, the goal of SPES is, the, the stated goal is to improve the educational outcomes and therefore to improve the employment of students. So the idea here is that from the perspective of, of Dole, that this extra fund will help students stay in school and that ultimately by completing their studies, it should improve their ability to find work. So this also goes to that issue about whether it's sufficient to just augment income. I think by the stated goals of the, of the program, perhaps not. Um, that said, you know, that, that could be a goal. Um, but I think here it's really the focus of SPES has been to help students stay in school. Um, one reason, one way you can see this is in the requirements that students have to be either enrolled in school or intending to enroll in school. And that they have to maintain a passing uh, GWA. And so the idea here is that again, we, they, they want the students to use this money to stay at school. Um, now that said, is that the goal of SPES all the way down? Sometimes. Sometimes the mayors view uh, SPES as a way to help improve educational achievement of their constituents and, and <coughs> see it in that way. Um, but certainly at a, at a certain point, you know, it, it could be to encourage voters um, and they tend to use it in that way. And you can see this in, in municipalities where they actually run their own employment programs independently of SPES, is that it's, it's trying to shore up that, that support. Um, the issue about cheaper workers because SPES is so dominated by the public sector, not by the private sector, its impact on providing cheaper work is not 
as massive as it could be. Almost if, if SPES was a program about reducing the cost to employers, you'd expect to see more private employers involved. Um, and that, that doesn't seem to be, it's, it's not the case, at least in the places where we were working. That said, we, I'm jumping around a little bit. So, so just a question about just aggregated data and whether we can look at the impact between private and public sector. We didn't have enough private sector employers to be able to do it. Um, not that they don't exist, but just in our sample, there weren't most of the municipalities where we were working, there were very few private sector employers. And if we split the data, we had a sample that was very, very small in the private sector and was specifically only working in three establishments. So it was hard to say much. Um, one of the challenges also with the private sector is that a lot of them do additional screening, right? So they do look for, for people who have particular skills. In a way that makes sense, they want people, if they're working in the service sector, to have particular experience with certain tasks, um, a willingness to work in that, good customer relations skills. But at the same time, it means that it limits, often students who get those positions are those who've already had those opportunities as well. So. It's one of the challenges that we just, we can't speak to the private sector very well here. Um, certainly, you know, the possibility that in this context that maybe Filipinos' families really value education and they're gonna do whatever it takes to make sure their students stay in school. Um, I, think, I think that may be something we're picking up on in the case that we have a lot of very low income families with very high enrollment rates. And you might expect that if you look at other countries, maybe that's not the case. Right? And that's something that's really fantastic. Um, it does mean, though, that if the purpose of SPES is to help students stay in school, that these are the, they're not the right people we want to be targeting. Right? We do know that there are many students in the Philippines who aren't able to finish their studies. Or even if they do, they aren't able to go on to college. And those are the people who, for whom this extra money might make a difference. The question is just how do we find them and get them the, the assistance they need and whether SPES is the right vehicle to do that. Um, other question about whether or not there was any um, sort of change in, I wrote down, inculcation of culture of work, of, of whether students sort of valued work more um, and had sort of better, you know, punctuality, better to, you know, to know they need to dress for the job, they need to be respectful of supervisors, those sorts of questions. Uh, we tried to capture those through the, there's a BLE Life Skills Index, which asks students to sort of rate their performance about, you know, I'm on time, I budget my money, I'm ready to work, those sorts of questions. Um, we didn't see any, any action on that at all. Um, people were, that said it was self-assessed, so people usually said nice things about themselves. Um, but they were equally likely to say nice things about themselves regardless of whether they went to SPES or not. Um, so there we, we didn't really see any, any, ish, any changes in terms of confidence or, or um, whether people were sort of more work ready or had kind of captured that, um, that idea. Certainly, I, I think what, you know, what one takeaway here is to think about if, if the program is to improve the education and we want to find people for whom they, this best is the help they need to, get their, to achieve their education objectives. If the goal is to get their work readiness, then we want to think about that. And if their goal is to, to augment their income, then we don't need to bother with the whole work thing, right? It's, it's sort of, There, I think in thinking about refining the program, we want to think about what each component does and doesn't do and think about a way to, to maximize that. And so if we think about if students are going to go to work, how can we make the work most useful to them? If students need to enroll to receive their payments, how do we help them find the students who need to enroll? Um, if it is just about supplementing cash, supplementing income, there may be more direct ways to do it that are cheaper and, and faster. Um, I mean, that's kind of what four pieces, right, is you need cash, cash. Um, there's a lot of hoops here if that's just the main goal. Um, and that said, there may be, you know, through effective work experience, there may be unique things that students aren't able to get access to otherwise that, that SPES can speak to. Now I've answered my questions. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yes, sir.
consider benefit incidence analysis to be done. That's one clarification that I want to And second, are you actually using cost benefit or cost effectiveness? If it's cost effectiveness, uh, which other program are you comparing it with? And what specific outcome are you looking at? Thank you. to what an alternative use is? No, we, we really were focusing just on 
what does this money get you? And what, you know, what, what is the right, basically what do you get out of each 100,000 pesos spent? Um, but certainly to put it into context requires thinking about other programs that are trying to do the same things is this more or less cost effective? That would definitely be an piece. important thing. So the question then is, and I, I was looking for four keys, cost effectiveness. Do you happen to know what the cost is per student enrolled? Um, I don't know. Okay. Well, okay. Because yeah, I, I was I was looking for a document that had done it, and I couldn't I couldn't find. Uh, yeah, ADB. Yeah, ADB would have to. Because I did it. Oh. But I forgot it. <laughs> So some, somewhere it is written down, and that would be a really natural thing to compare to, right? And I think certainly four piece would be a, would be a primary comparison program because of its scale and trying to achieve the same things. Um, then, uh, oh, to the, the comment about um, work immersion as a, as a way of targeting um, and, and reaching out, that might, that, yeah, I mean, in a, in a way, right, that's a way to identify a good target population, right? And so when we think about sort of what, what Dole can do to help reach out beyond the mayor's lists, um, that might be a really good way would be to partner with schools um, because they, they're going to know who are their most, uh, sort of who's below the poverty line and who might be sort of most, most at risk. Um, you know, one thing we've been talking about just kind of casually is sort of what, what targeting strategies are better. Like, could we, I mean, even with um, this thought on, would that be something that would be an improvement, right? Or working with the schools to identify students who are motivated but struggling, right? Like, that's that question of, you know, what, what we've learned now is that this targeting does not seem to be ideal, but then it opens a whole host of questions about what targeting is ideal. I don't have the answer to that today, but that would require, you know, some sort of trying things out, and I think a, a partnership with schools would be a, a really interesting interesting avenue. So thank you. So we're done with our last three questions. <laughs> Hello, my name is Teddy from the National Youth Commission. Uh, uh, just for information, uh, actually the SPES program is a product of uh, per capita uh, 1793 and uh, the prime principle of this um, is to help those students uh, who are uh, uh, have high percentage of dropping out out of school to, aug to augment them so this is like a uh, the space is like a educational assistant program for students who are most likely to drop out of school and I think one of the results of study is that uh, there's a certain percentage point of increase in terms of enrollment rate speak, speak, uh, specifically on the main counterparts in the study. Which is good because that's was, uh, that was the intention of the law, it's an intention of the program itself. Uh, in terms, in 2009, it was amended by RA 9547 to include out of school leave. And of course, the principle is to make them go to school again. So uh, actually, it's 2009, and uh, the 10th year of the law will be on 2019. So it's it's right for a sunset review, actually. So uh, it's my uh, actually it's a recommendation that part of your uh, study is to include some of the amendments because you have. Uh, identify some of the issue in the process of the SPES program, and then uh, you also identify the issues and challenges in terms of uh, implementing the program and the challenges on uh, uh, communicating with the national, the regional, and the uh, local PESO. So uh, I'm, I'm actually, it's a recommendation if you could have some points we could, uh, uh, identify to amend the law because SPES is uh, a product of a law. So it's for review, so it's also helpful for some of us from the employment sectors and also from Dole and other uh, agencies as concerned on employment and also on education to have some recommendations. So 
in terms of amendments on the SPES law, if SPES law will be continued, uh, what are those uh, policy actions we should uh, take in consideration? So, thank you. I'm uh, Rolando Dilema from the Commission on Higher Education. I guess uh, my question is uh, also linked with the, the NYC since we are from the government and uh, as part of uh, my uh, duty in our office, I'm, my office is in charge in the policy development of office of uh, student development and services in higher education in the country. And one among the policy that uh, we are doing is the internship program. And I guess uh, it's best one of our monitoring program in the country uh, provides a lot of uh, uh, support from the uh, higher education institutions, both of public and private. Uh, I guess uh, the, there is a, 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 a distinction between the cheap labor and the actual uh, training. If, if we will think about the real uh, uh, training or employment per se for this space, space is supposed to be employment uh, opportunity of students. Uh, the, the, the problem there is that uh, are we uh, engaging employment for those uh, young adults who are in secondary? Or uh, we are providing opportunity of uh, employment uh, for those candidates who have uh, a uh, potential skills for employment. And uh, with, with, with uh, your collection of uh, data, uh, it seems that uh, there are 40% uh, participated from secondary and 60 from, from the, the colleagues. And uh, now, in the, with, with that uh, cheap labor, I guess, uh, there's, there's a concern if uh, uh, the students uh, working in the industry are working uh, more of the time of the regular employment. For example, the, the, the real employment requires a manpower requirement in certain company is about 200, and your training is uh, more than uh, 100, that's uh, cheap labor. The NPP or the, the company is uh, getting more students uh, internship than employment requirement of uh, any other requirement. And so that's a challenge because uh, being after the uh, uh, policy implementations when we have a, a program, internship abroad, abroad meaning a Filipino uh, doing internship outside the country and doing internship in the Philippines. Doing internship in the Philippines, uh, we, 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 we check from our monitoring that this case is one among the, the institutions reported that's a good uh, program. Why? Because they put uh, allowances. Other than that, uh, industry or other company, NPP, is not providing uh, allowance to the trainees. And that's why there's question of uh, what is uh, uh, the real intention of the engagement of students for that program. And in our perspective in higher education, it's not the money, the money that they gain, it's the uh, experience and skills that they acquire after the program. And so we, we keep on imposing that. And with that, uh, I guess, uh, thank you for your parents for, for that uh, study, because uh, before that, like, we, uh, before hearing that uh, negative, negative uh, study in, in the uh, implementations, we keep on using that uh, program because of the opportunity of uh, those uh, college students getting uh, uh, allowance while uh, learning in the process, but somehow there's a, a disconnection because maybe uh, maybe we can uh, uh, talk about this as I mentioned by the NOIC. Maybe you can uh, uh, recommend for purposes of uh, policy or law enhancement because that uh, we have a current law on that and currently it's uh, under the uh, review from Congress and Senate, and we can uh, provide uh, support for uh, the, the, the continuation. I guess uh, uh, an adoption of the 21st century uh, realities, at the same time, same time, insulate the program for, from politics, because most of, most of the students engaged in that uh, employment is uh, in the municipalities, and you know, especially when, when you conducted that uh, uh, 
survey or study uh, 2016 is the election period and uh, maybe some of the students were engaged in some of the political uh, activity. So maybe considerations of skills uh, uh, enhancement or qualifications in, uh, enhancement rather than pure or uh, actual engagement employment. Not just employment, but rather than uh, acquisitions of those skills. And, and also, maybe in the data, there's a, a more than 25% of uh, the, the uh, respondents enrolled in second year in, in college. And with that, I, I have, I suspected that that's a, a, an associate program or a program towards uh, TESDA, not necessarily for higher education, plus uh, the common design of colleges in the internship program is towards the end of the uh, four year degree program. And so, maybe considerations of dual program. So, maybe uh, that would be considered in the second year if, if, they, have, if they have a skills trainings in TESDA. And lastly, I guess, uh, uh, the tailing of those uh, program to the requirement of being in the program in higher education so that when uh, the students engage in the program, uh, while they are uh, undergoing the training, they acquire the, the, the required training, required in the uh, program or the industry. And so they can should be, you know, sort of what amendment should be made to law, right? And, and that's an interesting question because <clears throat> for me as a researcher, I always want to say, oh, we should test all of these things. We should test all of these things first, test everything before we put something in law, because law feels very final. Um, and testing feels like at some place where there's room for experimentation. Now that said, to a certain, certain extent, because of the structure of SPES, that's not always possible. The way that the program changes is through new amendments to the law. But I think there were a few things that <clears throat> were very clear cut. Um, one very easy thing that that I think can be can be enshrined in law that I, I feel that we can quite confidently recommend is to improve the data reporting requirements. This is something where <clears throat> and the law that sort of you know, what do the forms look like? These are all in the implementing guidelines. And the data that's required to be passed up from the municipal offices up to the regional offices and then eventually to the national office is very, very minimal. All the regional office sees is the names of the students who receive the program, the number of days they work, and how much they earn. Which means that short of doing a large study like the one that we undertook, it's impossible to know even questions like how many of your beneficiaries are high school versus college? What is the gender makeup? What's the age distribution? How many of them go on to college? How many of them graduate? These are questions that are not expensive to collect information on, but require data require reporting requirements, and that data won't be collected unless it's required, right? Nobody signs up for extra work just for fun, especially data work. 
So that's one thing that I think would be a really, a, a very effective change to help understand more about how the program works um, that would be essential. I think the other thing, so this is in my lessons here, uh, you know, one thing that I think is a pretty straightforward one is to think really seriously about increasing the minimum number of days. <clears throat> Since the last amendment, uh, the num maximum number of days has risen from 52 to 78, and certainly there, if the, at, the, at the municipal level, if the minimum is 20, that's how many days students are going to work. And because of that, the amount of money they receive is going to be capped, and the amount of work experience they receive is going to be capped. And so even though they could employ up to 70, they're only going to do the minimum. And so that might be another area where there's room for, for motion. And then finally, the, the other thing that I think is worth seriously thinking about, though I don't have an explicit recommendation, is to think about making the recruitment process a little bit easier. So the amount of, of forms and work, you know, things have been streamlined pretty well, but for students who don't necessarily have the time to go back and forth to the pesos, who don't necessarily have uh, voter IDs or have all the different documentary requirements, um, who are more likely to be poorer students, that's gonna be something that's keeping them from, from their program. So I think those are the ones that are, are sort of pretty easy recommendations to make. I think anything, you know, anything more, certainly trying to depoliticize the program is something that I think would be really, really important. The question is how to do it, right? If, if for example, we removed all the cost sharing, so all the, all the amounts were just in the hands of the Dole and they provided 100% subsidy, that would give them all the control, but is that sufficient to actually have the program be more effective? I don't, I don't know, right? And we don't know, we haven't, we, haven't, we don't know what that looks like. Does that, would the mayor still be willing to do it? Would they not have an incentive at all? Would the whole program collapse, right? We just, we just don't know. So I think that's an area for experimentation, but not where we're at a point to make a recommendation. Um, the, other, the other issue about thinking about um, skills enhancement and the second year students, um, very few of our students that we were working with were TVET. Um, some were associates, but very few were in the TVET program. Um, but certainly there is, you know, a question about sort of the experience and the skills, and <clears throat> I'd be really interested to, to know, you know, what the impact is of, say, the government internship program versus SPES and how those things compare. Um, thank you. Because we, we just don't, you know, this is, this is a, a study that I, that I hope is really informative, um, but also it's one of those things that always highlights how much else we don't know, right? And so how does, certainly one thing that I think a longer program duration allows students to develop their skills more. And that contrast between the high school and the college level in terms of skills formation is really, is really important. Um, I mean, the other thing is that if there are skills gaps, that might be also a place for Julie to think about where are those gaps and what, do we, what are we trying to, to fix? What type of work experience are we trying to give students? Um, and so I think that's also something that's, that's really really important as well. I feel like there's one more thing I want to say. But I think I think that's all. Except, yeah, except to highlight again that I think the difference between college and high school is very is very important. They're getting very different, they have different skill sets, they have different opportunities, they have different needs, right? Um, at least we're seeing with like with work immersion at grades 11 and 12, it's not a bad time to start exposing people to the workforce, but the types of impacts you might have would be different. Something that you might want to mention as recommendation is kind of taking off from your really astute uh, observation about first moving forward, let's define what really the goals, what the goals of space, and that's because you really have several laws that are uh, involved here that needs to be uh, harmonized. Um, particularly in, the, in, in their application. So you have, the one that was mentioned is uh, uh, law on the, the underpin space. Then you have UNIPAS, which basically, that's at the college level, um, provides uh, student assistance, various types, grants, to etc. Um, and then re recently, the free tuition thing, and they are all convoluted. 
and and then you have of course the uh, which has been tested the uh, voucher system. Um, I I think you and then you have of course for peace, which basically funds the basic education uh, in in terms of the, of the enrollment and the and and, and, and like. It seems to me that this space, for example, might be actually a potential for uh, uh, generating uh, job opportunities, but it's not good from what I gather, uh, at least uh, in, the, in the short run, for building skills which may be needed in the, in the future. But in other words, let's look at this more holistically, looking at these various uh, laws and aspirations, and, 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 and so we have greater clarity and the definition of growth and a proper evaluation to be done. So Dr. Bean, before you, we entertain the last question, may, may I just uh, relay the uh, questions from one of our viewers on FB Live, okay? <laughs> So it's from Inda Dida Abayan. So here's the question. Are there indications in the findings on whether the program is consistent with both the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights? Okay, so let's entertain the last question. Okay, ma'am. I think one of the challenges is that, um, I mean, what's really great is that there are so many departments and agencies that are concerned with how to help students stay in school and finish, and how to help students find jobs. Like that is, and that's terrific that we have life unit programs, we have four Ps, we have internship programs, we have free tuition, we have tests. I mean, there's a whole lot of things going on. Um, certainly, they are overlapping in some ways. And certainly there's a role for a conversation about who's best equipped to do which which thing and, and whether there also are, are, are complementarities as well, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm listening to, you know, thinking about some of the uh, work immersion program and like what if that were for the government internships or private internships, you know, if students had an allowance, maybe that would help, right? So there, there might be role, a role for that. Um, that requires a lot of coordination, but I think would be really, like a, a really important thing to think about. Um, to the, the question from, from Facebook about the UN Convention on Human Rights and the Rights of the Child, I have, I have nothing useful to say on that right now. <laughs> I'm sorry, I am, yes. I am, <laughs> I am woefully ignorant, I confess. <laughs> um, but I think it's an important thing to think don't have the answer right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, so the grade 11 driving employment versus uh, education. We actually, so we split five levels between high school and college and the employment effect is driven in mm -hmm. the college and the education is driven in the high school actually. So it's, it, it appears consistent with the, the college students are the ones more likely to find jobs, more likely to find part-time jobs, more likely to have skills and be rewarded for them, they seem to be the ones getting the employment benefit. Um, though again, our statistical power to detect differences is pretty limited, so I, I say that with some caution. 
Um, and then the, the question about how much program implementation varies. Um, part of me wants to say it varies enormously because certain aspects do vary enormously. So recruitment procedures do vary and the types of students that are reached varies across areas. And some, each program has their own little features. Like if you have a, a specific life skills day, some have orientations. I swear someone had something called Best Got Talent. It was, it, was, it, was called, it, was called, it was something like that. Like they had a talent show, right? And that sort of thing. That said, I don't want, when I highlight the role of program variation to, I don't want that to overshadow that by and large, all the students work the jobs, all the students get paid, well, most of the students get paid. Um, those factors are implemented correctly to our, to our knowledge, right? We don't see students who do SPES and never have to work. Um, I'm sure somewhere there's a ghost student who's not really doing anything, but we didn't find them. So those big picture things are being implemented pretty uniformly. So when we say there are variations, there definitely are. I think the biggest ones that would affect the study would be in the selection of applicants. And so it's possible that's where there's differences. But the concern, you know, that, that I've seen with other programs, right? Like, did SPES actually happen? Yes, it did happen. So that we feel pretty confident. Questions. So, thank you, Doc. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Just okay. Yes. okay. Yes. You had Estes babies on the second slide. Can you clarify what Estes babies are for the audience? Oh yeah. So I did mention this explicitly. So there's there's a yeah. It's very astute. You saw my Estes babies. Uh, they're the students who are returning. So one of the one of the objectives of the program is not just to help people once and then you know say here's your one off program but rather to invest in them across multiple years. Now, that means that in some ways you could say we're underselling the program because maybe it takes multiple years of support for SPES to have an impact. That said, it also takes, it also gets more and more expensive over multiple years. Um, it was not feasible to include those students in our study because to withhold, essentially they're the priority, so it was not considered politically feasible at all to withhold SPES from the, from the babies. Um, that said, they also, in general, we don't have great numbers, but they only make up about 13 to 15% overall. So even if we're missing the impact for those students, um, by and large, the majority are really first timers who don't necessarily come back. So we can't speak to those students, essentially, is the takeaway there. Thank you for the advice to informing me because I was really, <laughs> I was ready to ask a question about out of school youth and I thought they were excluded. It turns out it was amended to include them because if there's any group that would be interested or would be helped by some funds to enroll and to enroll for them, they would be the out of school youth who do not finish high school. So just the question, I mean, I don't know whether there's been any, because this is bias for the formal system. Uh, but were there any samples at all of out-of-school youth enrolled in SPES? So the short answer is that we can't speak to them. But the long answer is that it's complicated. So <laughs> it's always complicated, right? So, so one challenge with the out-of-school youth is that in some pesos, they were prioritized, and therefore we couldn't randomize them. So we couldn't include them because it was considered a priority. In other pesos, they exclude the out of school youth because they find them tricky to get into school, so they don't want to work with them. <laughs> and then in others, they let them be, and they participate in our study. They just make up a very, very small share. So we're not able to differentiate the impacts. Um, but certainly when we think about, you know, sort of who are these marginal students you know, is, you know, maybe they need more support than just the money, right? Maybe they need support plus, you know, maybe a longer duration of work or, you know, additional assistance. Um, the out-of-school youth, also the students in alternative learning systems, those are students who have made the decision to enroll, 
despite challenges, despite being quite poor, like those might also be students where there's a lot to benefit. We just can't speak to it as a separate group in our study. Um, but I completely agree that, yeah, these are those are the students you want in some ways. So that concludes <laughs> our first. Thank you very much, Dr. B, for a very comprehensive presentation and for the active participation of our audience. Okay, so be, but before you leave, may we request you to please fill out the forms, the evaluation forms for this activity, and uh, submit it to the Secretariat ASEP. Thank you very much. Hope to see you in our future activities.